is brought to you by Kenneth Nugent. From the station that's on your side, this is News 12 at 6 o'clock. First on News 12 at 6 o'clock, new developments in the arrest of a local teacher charged with sexual battery. The story we've been following for a couple of weeks now, a pattern of inappropriate behavior and allegations of assault against 40-year-old Scott Hooker. News 12's Will Rio live in our newsroom with another allegation just coming to light. Will? Yeah, we've received a new police report from Burke County filed just this past Friday. The report says deputies spoke to a mother who says Hooker taught his daughter this year. She says ju they just learned about this his past disciplinary action and arrest. The report says earlier this year, the mother tried to get her daughter a new teacher after Hooker made her daughter uncomfortable. She says the school denied her request for a new teacher and that Hooker was adamant about being her daughter's only tutor and having one one-on-one -on -one tutoring with her. This comes as we've been following Madison Cooksey's story out of Columbia County, who is now calling for change. It was an emotional moment for Madison Cooksey and her family as she stood up in front of members of the Board of Education and delivered an emotional plea for change. With my experience in reporting and putting my trust in the administration and board to advocate for me, I was failed. And I hope that in the future, any student slash employee reporting sexual harassment will be properly advocated for taken seriously and protected. It wasn't easy for her to speak in front of the board members, not only because she was nervous, but because she says they almost didn't let her. She received a call on the morning ahead of the meeting, which the school board says is protocol. Who told me that I should talk about the topic of discussion, that it was too vague um, for their liking, and wanted to know what I was going to be talking about at the meeting, and if it was something that they could handle internally, and if it was something that really needed to be put out onto the board and spoke about publicly. When Cooksey went to the meeting, she says they told her she couldn't speak because she didn't show up on time, according to their policy, even though she was waiting out in the hallway before the deadline. I hope I got through to them, or at least some people, in the meeting. She broke down, saying more needed to be done after multiple incidents. At what point does it take for the disciplinary actions to be put in place? The educator had multiple chances to victimize young female students she was around. There are so many questions that need to be answered as to why this is still happening. In Scott Hooker's personnel file we requested, the Evans High School principal and Columbia County superintendent both say if something like this happens again, he could be fired. Two months later, deputies were called to Evans High after incident reports say Madison Cooksey told deputies Hooker would often cross paths with her and stand next to her while staring at her. Hooker continued to teach at Evans before handing in his resignation at the end of the school year. Five years later, he did it again, and this could have easily prevented, be prevented if someone had listened to me. We asked Columbia County about Hooker's pattern of issues involving female students. In an email response, they say the district did not acknowledge a pattern, though letters in his personnel file show the superintendent was concerned about his past interactions with female students. I just don't understand how if something is in writing and you're looking at it and you're telling me that it's not true when it's right in its face, I just, I don't see how you can do that. Now in the state sexual harassment policy sent to me by Columbia County, it states sexual harassment is conduct or speech of sexual advances, favors, taunts, threats, and demands of physical touch, which creates a hostile environment. The school district adds if any member of the public has concerns about a policy, they can voice those concerns. It certainly is concerning. Will, thanks for staying on top of that story for us. Yeah, glad she spoke up and had the courage to speak up. She did a great job at that meeting. Well, there's more news to come as we give you a live look outside the Calhoun. Continuing coverage now on the 2019 death of Columbia County toddler Lincoln DeVette. Today was the day three of this murder trial for Charles Sconyers. And Sconyers is the boyfriend of Lincoln's mother and was an Augusta firefighter at the time of Lincoln's death. Today, he is back in court where the prosecution just rested its case. You saw Slota Cohn live now from Columbia County Superior Court with new details from inside the courtroom today. Sloan. Well, the, the state rested their case today after hearing from nearly 20 witnesses. The majority of the day was broken up in between hearing from the GBI medical examiner who performed the autopsy on Lincoln DeVette and one of the investigators in the case. At the very end of the day, the defense finally called its first witness to the stand. In this case, what manner of death did you um, find or determine? I uh, assigned the manner of death as homicide. Zarazaw completed the autopsy of Lincoln DeVette. 
She looks at the medical information, different elements of the investigation, physical body, and history provided. I would say what would make this not a homicide would be a suitable historical account of an event that would adequately explain the injuries that I have. And Investigator Gaston's reports agreed. Yeah, I don't want to be around the bush. Like you said, you don't want to be surprised. But I can tell you that this didn't come from him falling out the back door. He says doctors told him the wound would not have been caused by a hand and there would be no biological evidence to look for in the home. And he pointed out the last video we saw of Lincoln alive. Sonia is carrying him out of daycare, noticeably upset. Uh, when the defendant picks him up and brings him down the hallway, he's upset. Um, and I can tell from that video, he says, that's enough. Who says? Michael Sconyers. Once the defense took over, one of his close friends testified speaking on Sonia's character. He says Sonia's is not violent, he's laid back, willing to help others, and always loved being around children. Uh, if I called him and eat him um, for an emergency situation, to watch, you know, you know, my stepdaughter, or if I needed him, I could always pick the phone up and call him. Now we're just starting to hear from the defense. Tomorrow we expect to hear from more lay witnesses and experts, and the judge does say that he hopes to have a final verdict by the beginning of next week, but there's still a lot to unpack before we get there. Okay, interesting developments in the courtroom, Sloan, thanks. We are in the second week. For a look at local polling locations and voting hours, head to our website, WRDW.com. Just ahead on News 12 at 6 o'clock, new business booming in Augusta. We'll take you live to one local business just breaking ground. Next. Time, Augusta's own Amy Grant returns for a special performance at the Miller Theater on Wednesday, May 25th. Grant will perform selections from her 30-year career, so don't wait. Get tickets now. Go to the box office or to MillerTheaterAugusta.com. We have an update on the opening date of the new Dave & Buster's on Cabela Drive off Riverwatch Parkway, our next-door neighbor. This is a live look from our station camera, and we just showed you the new sign that went up yesterday, and now we're learning they are set to open almost a month ahead of schedule. That's right. The company says doors will actually open June 27th now. They're still hiring. They're looking for managers, servers, cooks, game techs, and a whole lot more. So we have the link to apply on our website at WRDW.com. But if they can get those positions filled, yeah. they're ready to open the door. There's a lot of progress next door. There's some other businesses coming here to Cabela Drive as well. News 12's Maria Sellers live next door to the Guitar Center where a new store just broke around yesterday. And Maria, you say there's more to come to this area. Oh, yeah. Local boutique My Store is set to open their second Augusta location right here off Cabela Drive. It'll be the only one of their four locations that will be in the same city as another store. I spoke to the manager earlier who told me they chose this area because of the potential for growth. Um, we've just seen a lot of development in that area and I think it's a great opportunity for us to have more foot traffic through. So we're really excited to see what's coming. Till has worked at the store for six years as they have expanded into other counties, but she is excited to bring in even more business to Augusta. This way we have a variety of locations and more opportunity for more people to come in. But for Augusta to continue to grow, it isn't just about bringing in new business. Bringing new businesses in is exciting, but you wanna make sure that you keep the ones that you have as well. The Economic Development Authority is working on about $100 million worth of expansion projects right now, and that's just in the industry sector. People are realizing that Augusta has a fantastic quality of life. Also, if you look at the cost of living, it's basically like getting a 5% bonus every year because it costs less to live here. The Development Authority says they're seeing growth downtown and are working toward expansion in South Augusta as well. So we're hoping that with the workforce base there, that's going to be the place that you're really going to see a large amount of growth. And that growth throughout the city is good news to growing businesses. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for us to bring in more clientele. Yeah, and there is no set date on exactly when this fourth location will be open, but they're hope, hoping to have it almost fully operational by the end of the year. 
And we are slowly watching this plaza fill up. It's great to see some neighbors coming up. Maria, thanks for the live update there. Let's have a look outside now. I-20 and Riverwatch Parkway. Let's see. On your sideline, sports brought to you by the Hawk Law Group. Well, after nine years of unparalleled dedication to the Jersey Girls basketball program and the Augusta sports community, Juwan Bailey is on to the next leg in his coaching journey. Bailey will be heading to Covington, Georgia to become the next head coach of the girls' basketball program at Newton High School. Bailey leaves a legacy of Jersey, bringing the program its second state title in the 2021 season after a 23-year drought, not to mention a Class AA Final Four appearance this past season. During his tenure with the Lady Eagles, he picked up a 178-75 record with five straight 20-win seasons. Well, it was Kyle Wright's ugly start of the season. A dentist sub to ERA as the headliner gave up six runs in the second inning of a 9-4 loss against the Red Sox. The young right-hander is no stranger to blow-up innings. In 2019, the Nationals put up nine against him. Fast forward to the 2020 National League Championship Series. Wright was charged with seven runs in the first inning against the Dodgers. And though last night was a mirror of his former past, manager Brian Snicker believes he's still the option. Always going to be a learning experience for these guys. You're going to, you know, everything's going really good. There are going to be setbacks, and things aren't going to just go as planned and perfect. And you're going to have to weather storms. And I kind of feel like he did tonight. The experience of that will help him where he can control that any even better than, you know, and, and limit it at three runs instead of instead of six. The first pitch is at 7:29. 7 tonight for game two. Silicon. A new approach to curbing gun violence, how a local professor and the Richmond County Sheriff's Office are teaming up to help curb crime. The Live View County Exhibition Center is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Financing available. New numbers show Augusta ranks as one of the deadliest cities in the nation. In the latest stats from the FBI's 2019 crime data, stats show a 0.3% increase in the number of people murdered all across America compared to 2018. Augusta ranking with the 32nd highest per capita murder rate in all major U.S. cities. News Club's Claire Allen joins us now in the studio with more on how this kind of data can help curb crime in Richmond County. According to the FBI's crime data, the murder rate in Augusta is 17.69 per 100,000 people. So far this year, there have been 13 homicides involving guns. I spoke with an AU professor who was able to give insight into the common interest he shares with Richmond County Sheriff's Office to help reduce gun violence. If we know what works, we're not lacking resources, but I think we're lacking a willingness to invest. Professor Todd Williams has spent years analyzing gun violence data in Augusta to help decrease gun violence. And what we have found is that in those two years, the gun violence archive misses about 60% of gun data that happens locally. Williams and the Richmond County Sheriff's Office Intelligence Division use that data to target and talk to people at risk of being victims of gun violence. Those talks are where the program Augusta Gives Back comes in. Right from the jump, it's designed not to be threatening, not to be coercive. The program offers a number of services, including mental health counseling. Housing, job training, helping them get their GED, um, substance abuse counseling. The idea is to rethink policing and use data to prevent crimes instead of just tracking them. They say, look, we have reason to believe, based upon your network ties and your background, you are at risk at being a victim of gun violence in the future. We have a program that may be helpful to you in avoiding that. The Augusta Gives Back program started back in 2019 and is still active. If you would like to know more about the program, we would have their contact information on our website and keep you updated for more programs. Claire, thank you for that. We've also been telling you about the city's push for a new contract with Gold Cross EMS, calling for more accountability, and now we're getting a better idea of what that looks like. New South Kennedy here has talked to commissioners about how they plan to stay on top of response times to make sure you get quick emergency care. We're still getting concerned. I got one just yesterday morning. The focus of the new contract with Gold Cross EMS is more accountability, especially when it comes to response times. But I just know it's something that needs to be done based on the volume of what 
calls you get in terms of people talking about poor arrival times. Commissioners would like the contract to include a standard response time, like under 30 minutes, for example. And if an ambulance goes over that time, Gold Cross will have to pay a fine. So anytime you can kind of hold people accountable in a way that they feel it in their pocketbook and what have you, it does make good business sense. DeKalb County did something similar with their EMS provider, AMR. According to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, AMR had to pay nearly $2 million in penalties for slow response times. Now, the complaint dies. Somebody raises a little hell for a few days, and then it's gone. Separate from the contract, Commissioner Williams is also proposing a committee to investigate Gold Cross complaints. This is to establish that, and establish a procedure that the public can have and be aware of to file complaints and, and issues with the provider. Time, money, just words on a page, but it might mean the difference between life and death. Kennedy Harris, on your side. Commissioners will be meeting soon for a work session. They'll talk about a standard arrival time and possible fine amounts. Well, we did hit the mid and low 80s this afternoon.